from every tribe and every nation, from every people and every tongue, from every corner of the whole creation, comes a new song that must be sung. Comes a new song that must be sung. From every tribe and every nation, from every people and every tongue, from every corner of the whole creation comes a new song that must be sung. From every tribe and every nation, from every people and every tongue, from every corner of the whole creation, comes a new song that must be sung. Try that last phrase. Comes a new song that must be sung. One more time, comes a new song that must be sung. The word must feels really strong, doesn't it? it that might be sung, it could be sung, but actually no, that must be sung. What new thing needs to be brought into being that must be sung in our midst today? Uh, maybe I ask, what, is, what song is the Holy One singing in you today? Uh, and even what song is the Holy, sing, the Holy One singing through creation, through this beautiful autumn chill in the air this morning? <laughs> you can just echo after me. Each phrase is an echo. So, from every tribe, from every tribe, and every nation, every nation, from every people, every people, and every tongue, and every tongue, from every corner, every corner of the whole creation, the whole creation, comes a new song that must be sung. Comes a new song that must be sung. You might feel like you're interrupting me, but you're not. Uh, be a bold response this morning. You can overlap those phrases. It's like waves of the ocean. You know, they just kind of fall over each other. No one seems to mind. One more time, friends, as you put this in your bodies and sing. From every tribe and every nation and every people and every tongue from every corner of the whole creation comes a new song that must be sung. Comes a new song that must be sung. I invite you to uh, just take a breath as you're here in this space with me this morning. Maybe you'll find your feet on the floor and you'll just become aware of your own breath in your body. I invite just to exercise in presence. This box here, uh, I call her a Shruti box, and it is a word uh, in Sanskrit, actually, that means sounding or singing. Uh, it's an instrument that's associated often with Carnatic singing in the South Indian classical tradition. But as you can hear, it provides that beautiful droning energy. This kind of gives us a little bit of a cushion so we don't feel so exposed perhaps, but like an accordion or like an organ for that matter, it sustains that air in a beautiful steady way. It plays, it plays as many notes as I want it to play with a little keyboard on the back. We had, we had bagpipes two weeks ago, not, not dissimilar. Friends, I wonder if you might just for a moment enter into that drone with me. Be careful, be careful, we've got a moving camera. You might take a breath and just join me on singing that one note together. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want to sing this note. 
whichever note, breathe whenever you need to and just enter the sustained sound of this instrument with me. Breathe whenever you need to. Beautiful sound, beautiful, sustained, rich sound. Breathe whenever your body needs to breathe. And as you continue to sing, listening in to the voices around you, what do you hear? We warm up our bodies and our breath as we sing together today. I invite you to sustain that drone now while I sing over you. From every tribe and every nation, beautiful. From every people and every tongue, from every corner of the whole creation comes a new song that must be sung. Now, but go back to that echo. Echo me. From every tribe and every nation, from every people and every tongue, from every corner of the whole creation, comes a new song that must be sung. A new song that must be sung. Thank you, friends. New songs, maybe even new instruments, new ways of singing together. I don't know the last time we, maybe in our Presbyterian uh, sort of context of worship, have droned on a note. <laughs> maybe if we were in a Orthodox or a Byzantine church, or maybe if we were even in a, a, a yoga studio, oming and chanting, but just wanting to recognize and honor the, the different and varied ways in which we can and do make music as humans. And I hope that last time we were together, uh, back at the end of October, it was just a, a little bit of a taste of, wow, as we look both into the riches of our hymnal which I might say has an extraordinary amount of music from other cultures and traditions in it in comparison specifically to, to earlier hymnals in the Presbyterian tradition. We also access sometimes music that comes also from a space of oral tradition learning and teaching. And, and in that particular piece by a Lutheran pastor and musician, Ray McKeever, love that invitation, friends. I'm happy to. It's a Shruti. Box. S H R U T I. Shruti. Shruti. Yeah, say it to your neighbor. Say it's a Shruti box. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm very not cheeky in calling it, it, naming it her because the word in Sanskrit is feminine. Um, and so to imagine the, the singing voice of the box, it's on C right now, C and a G. Yep, yep. And, uh, and you can adjust it as you need. <coughs> Friends, I thought today that it would be a really wonderful opportunity to reflect on uh, this idea of singing a new song. And I shared uh, last time I was with you that, that singing a new song is not necessarily, well, how do I say? When we look at the words of scripture, what does Psalm 98 say? Sing. Sing a new song unto the Lord, or sing God a new song. It is not written, as I understand it, as kind of an option. It, it might actually be not a command, but it might be an encouragement. It might be an exhortation. It might be actually sing a new song to God. And that, that when we think about the idea of the newness, of something. I don't know about you, but I just started a, um, a new thing in my life. Is anyone familiar with the Brazilian martial art called capoeira? It is a uh, dance 
martial art form. I won't demonstrate too much for you, but you basically, you spend inordinate amounts of time in the class going like this, and then <laughs> swinging your arms and your legs in these wild circular kicks. Friends of mine recommended it to me. They said, Paul, you'd love this. <laughs> the best part of it is that you actually get to, as part of what, when you play capoeira, everyone gets an instrument or their hands, and they sing these short chants usually in Portuguese, about the play of capoeira, and it's a communal activity done in a circle. I went to my first class a little over a month ago, and I've got to be honest, it was one of the most difficult things I've done in my adult life. I had no idea where to start. I only knew someone said, you would love this. I walked into a class. The mestre, who is the, the director, the, 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 the sensei, only speaks in Portuguese. So I am in a class experiencing an extraordinary amount of disorientation. <laughs> I'm just watching the person next to me. I'm paying really close attention. I'm looking at eye contact, at facial cueing. I'm trying to figure it out as I'm doing it. And in some way, I've come to the understanding that all learning, all learning, though maybe not as extreme an example as that, is going to be disorienting to us. That when we engage with something that's outside of our cultural experience, when we engage with something that's outside of our comfort zone, what does that create for you? What is your experience of new in your body? How many of you are so excited every time you experience something new. <laughs> I, I, no, thank you, the laughter tells me something. It tells me, oh my goodness. Uh, I remember when I was first in DC and I was getting to know my way around the city. And for the first three or four weeks, I won't repeat what I said every time I took a wrong turn. And I was not sure where I was because I didn't, my brain didn't have a reference point for this place, for those, the, the roundabouts for the weird arrangement of the streets. So I want to name out loud that even as I am coming to you today as a person who's sharing something new with you, I also want to, to, to name myself also as a learner alongside you. I and all of us who are in places of leadership, I hope are taking opportunities to try new things. And I hope you are too. And I also hope you're gentle with yourself as you do it. But that scripture says, sing to God a new song. Maybe is that part of what, why scripture says, sing a new song? That God actually wants us to stay in that malleable, flexible, learning, maybe even slightly disoriented space. That is not an easy space. But friends, for how many of you has your life of faith been a walk in the park? <laughs> it hasn't, right? So for how... For us to experience newness, to practice learning and experiencing new things, might actually be an invitation into becoming the people God has called us to be, into developing ability to improvise, to adapt, to try new things as they come along to us. And also, may I also say, practice gentleness with ourselves, forgiveness with ourselves. When, you know, I didn't get that note exactly. <coughs> But over time, and with repetition, and with rehearsal or practice, it's amazing what we can accomplish together. Some of you have hymnals, and if you don't have one, there are a couple extra on the table. I want to sing together with you, and invite you to just echo after me. It's uh, number 637. Speaking of Portuguese. Canteos. Un canci con novo, cante al Señor. Un canci con novo, cante al Señor. Un canci con novo, cante al Señor. Cante al Señor. Cante al Señor. Say it. Cante al Señor. Un canci con novo. Un canci con novo. Echo after me. Cante al Señor, un canci con novo. Cante al Señor, un canci con novo. Cante al Señor, un canci con novo. Cante al Señor, 
un canci con nuovo con te o oh Señor, un canci con nuovo con te o oh Señor, un canci con nuovo con te o oh Señor, con te o oh Señor, con te o oh Señor, con te o oh Señor. Without looking further into the hymnal, and even asking yourself, oh my gosh, Paul, what are you doing? I don't even see these words on the page. <laughs> Friends, what are you noticing already about this melody? What are you noticing about its shape, its energy, and its feeling? What feeling or energy words are bubbling up as you hear this melody? What do you feel? Momentum. Momentum. It's in three, isn't it? Do you notice what happens with three? Just try that, friends. Put that in your body. Just one, two, three. One, two, three. Feel it somewhere. Even if it's, yeah, with your feet, in your hands. Something that lets you feel it. Yeah, one more time. Cante al Señor, un canci con novo. Cante al Señor, un canci con novo. Cante al Señor. Un canci con nuovo, cante al Señor, cante al Señor. What else do you notice or feel or experience in this particular melody, in the feeling of it? Happy, sad, joyful? Joy! Joy. It's a waltz. It's a waltz, it's a waltz, yes, indeed. You might just feel yourself wanting to turn a little bit of a circle. It, it comes out of a Latin American context, I might add. It's a Latin American folks. Do you, do you notice if I did something, though? Friends, joyful? Yes, and do you hear? What if we sang, Cante al Señor, un canci con novo, cante al Señor. Now we're actually more like a Viennese waltz. But where are we in, where do we say Brazil? Some say Brazilian folk melody. Some say this is actually pan-Latin American. It could be also sung in Spanish. But friends, it's a joyful sound, but within a minor key, which I think is actually a really interesting noticing intention, right? Because joy, sadness, joy, yes, friends. Do those things not live next to each other? And doesn't our praise sit sometimes in that place between sadness and joy? Yeah, any other noticing just about the melody, the shape, the energy, the feeling? It's, it's E minor, indeed it is. No, 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 no. Um. We might associate that with a, another feeling of a hymn. Uh, there are many other minor key hymns in our hymnal that fit in that kind of cast, but this is a dance, and it's also in a minor key. Let's hold that tension for a little bit. What else? Any other noticings or anything else you see or feel, experience? Kind of longer holds on those notes. Yeah. So, so we're moving, then we're holding. So this bum, 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 ba, just say it. Bum, 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 ba. It's kind of a, an energy and a roundness, a lift, and, but that, those long held notes at the end do something, don't they? They create the energy for the next phrase. What else? Someone else is going to do something. Repetition. Lots of repetition. Three times in the first verse. There it is. So we have the same text repeated three times, and the melody is kind of a similar shape. Watch it. Uh, just f trace it with your hand if you like. Yum pa dum pum pa. 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 What do you notice even in that investigation, topographically? Lots of up and down, big jumps. Do you notice? This isn't stepwise motion. This is a bold proclamation. Yeah. Anything else? I, I think it, it relates to a group. I mean, I can't think that this is a single dancer. I, I think of it as almost like a walk or a celebration of some sort. 
imagine circles of dance happening simultaneously. And again, as you're saying, it's isn't just an individual experience, but something of this, maybe because it's also a folk song, feels deeply communal. Something that people would share in the context of their ordinary lives, not just in church, though church actually for many people is a place for dance. It is a place for joyful fiesta. Uh, some people in, in Latin America, there is an idea of, of Eucharist, which we'll celebrate today as the Gran Fiesta, the great feast of the people of God. One time in a Presbyterian church that I served in St. Louis, Missouri, we actually had Colombian dancers come. And we had a World Communion Sunday with Colombian dance. And we had probably one of the most joyful communion celebrations I've ever experienced where there was spirited music during the communion. Uh, Eucharistic uh, prayer in particular. And you know, friends, it was hard for a lot of people. It was really disorienting because in our tradition, we can also think about the Eucharist as what? As a memorial, as a feast, as a serious and weighty thing. Those two things sit sometimes in tension and side by side. Let's sing this. I've talked enough. And thank you, friends. These are great insights. I would say, let's sing it one time in Portuguese. Cante ao Senhor um cantico, cantico, cantico novo. I've learned about Portuguese, you have to kind of let go of that last vowel sound. No, no. Yeah, good. Let's sing it. And then let's sing a couple verses in English. Cante ao Senhor. Cante ao Senhor. the Spirit, oh shout to our God. than you were. How does it feel to sing something with such a, such rhythmic energy? How does it feel in your body? Just pay attention. What are you noticing inside of your body as you're singing? Wakes you up, as you said. Just kind of feel. Uh, revived. Energized. Revived. Good. Lighter. Just paying attention to that feeling that our experience of newness, right? Our experience of newness may actually open us to new experiences of God's presence, God's work, God's voice in our lives and in the lives of our communities. And so this, as I said, new things, experiencing new things is a practice that opens up doors, I would hope, to deepen faith to a more expressive faith, to a way that we can bring what I pray would be our whole selves to the God who made us. And I want to read some words. John Bell, some of you may know, he is a very good Scottish Presbyterian, uh, comes out of and from a space of uh, really rich um, compositional uh, creativity himself. John Bell, who was uh, with the Wild Goose Worship Group in, Ed in Edinburgh, Scotland, and with the Iona community, which maybe some of you have even visited or been on pilgrimage to, 
um, on the island of Iona uh, in the Hebrides. And he writes, as to why God wanted new songs, we can only conjecture. It may be that God was fed up with the old ones, despite the people's affection for their favorites, which they presumed to be God's favorites too. We see this in the prophecy of Amos, where God astonishes the participants in a primitive praise band, saying, stop your noisy songs. I do not want to listen to the sound of your harps, for which he reads guitars and or organs. What lay behind this outburst was the fact that for the community of faith, harmless hymns had become a substitute for action on matters of social justice. And God would not let that be. God wanted not simply praise from the head or the heart, but God wanted commitment of body, mind, and spirit. This is one good reason for ensuring that people in charge of the music for worship see themselves as part of a greater picture of congregational life and witness, not some autonomous sector dedicated, dedicated to providing beautiful sounds as a relief from what might be the turgid preaching or adult congregational. I don't think there's turgid preaching here. <laughs> but this is, I think, the point. When the song of the church has become tantamount to sentimentality or deliberately avoids the hard issues of the day or the real issues in people's lives, God has every right to tell us to shut up. Mm -hmm. But from a more human perspective, and allied to our discovery that songs are part of our gift to God. We continue to explore, friends, how we make and why we make new songs. To that point, I want to invite you to a little bit of storytelling. In the congregation that I mentioned earlier, where we had a grand fiesta celebration of the Eucharist, it was my very first church job in St. Louis, Missouri, at Trinity Presbyterian Church. Just near Washington University. I'd been called there right out of graduate school and I was green and learning and also maybe naive and also extraordinarily excited. <laughs> I got a job, you know? <laughs> and it was a full-time church job. We know that that is not, in these days at least, uh, as common or as, uh, as uh, you know, not always possible for some congregations. My, con my pastor who I worked with, the Dr. Dan Anderson Little, uh, he, I remember one Sunday, or one, maybe one Sunday, it was a Wednesday or Tuesday in a worship planning meeting, he said to me, Paul, he said, I love that we sing some of the same music week after week, but I also am getting a little tired of the Gloria Patri. Not that it's a bad piece of music, and mind you, this is a fourth generation Presbyterian pastor that I'm talking to, not someone who has just dropped into this from, from outside, but Dan also had had the experience of living in Detroit, Michigan and singing gospel choirs, going to Zimbabwe and spending time with African Christians and making music in African context. He had a rich, he sang with Dale Warland at McAllister College and had an extraordinary experience of beautiful choral music and choral singing. So he came with some musicianship and I trusted him. And he said, what do you think, could we find another Gloria to sing? And what I heard, perhaps, looking back at that underneath the surface was him saying, I hope that our congregation can find a way to, as he says, says here, not simply praise from the head or heart, but a commitment of body, mind, and spirit. That, friends, that moment in our worship where we are forgiven, right? That that becomes a moment where we actually hold the potential for newness, for something else to grow in our lives, and we give God praise for that. And so through a process uh, of oh, looking around, finding some things, bringing them back, no, that didn't work, and looking within the repertoire that I knew within different hymnals and traditions, I said, I think I'm just going to have to write one. <laughs> and so glory to God, whose goodness shines on me, which we'll sing this morning and which is in the hymnal, which in 2013 was, was or maybe a little earlier than that, was selected by the hymnal committee to be part of the hymnal. Who knew that when I wrote it for my congregation in St. Louis, Missouri, in I think that was 2003 or 2004, when it was originally written, 
would become a song that would allow that congregation to experience, and other congregations to experience something that, as someone jokingly said to me, is akin to Presbyterians actually like kind of dancing, <laughs> um, which was hilarious. But I want to notice, friends, that the new song that must be sung did not yet exist. It was, it was waiting to be heard. It was waiting to be caught, to be listened for and listened to. And I want to also name that that piece came out of a very profound sense of awakening in my own life. And I want to give witness to that. And regardless of where we may sit in terms of conversations around this in the church, I had gone to Trinity Presbyterian Church for one particularly strong reason, and that was that it was an LGBTQIA-affirming congregation. And as a person who had been in a situation in a prior church where a candidate who'd been brought to the congregation as a final candidate for ministry was rejected by the session because of rumors of her sexual orientation, I felt a deep sense of unsafeness. And in my emerging sense of who I was needed a place where I could feel that I was welcomed as God made me and welcomed and beloved. And so in glory to God whose goodness shines on me, when I wrote those words and to the spirit, do you know the next part? Whose love has set me free. I wasn't just talking about maybe in some metaphoric sense of liberation, I was speak, speaking to and naming a very deep experience that I was holding or needing of liberation from fear, liberation from shame, um, and I think liberation from ways of thinking about God that would limit maybe even the possibility that I was welcomed into that conversation. And so I don't know that many congregations have gotten the backstory of that so much, but I share it with you because that is a new song. And I think it's a way that somehow something bubbled up within that needed to be named, it needed to be shared, and it needed to be offered. Um, and so as we sing it this morning, we won't sing it right now. I would invite you to, with that new, perhaps sense of where that new song came from, imagine that there might even be within you, within this community or within other communities, a song that has yet to be sung, a something that has yet to bubble up in the imagination of God. Let's look at something else that I also wrote that's in the hymnal, and I hope this doesn't feel a little bit like a Paul Vasile musical review this morning. I'm gonna be careful. I got, I got a second job in New York City in serving at Park Avenue Christian Church and was so grateful to be in a community that welcomed the gifts that I was bringing to that space. But that was a congregation that also had some really unique character. It was a racially diverse congregation pastored by an African-American man. I was working with musicians from New York City. Can you imagine the, the, the incredible range of musicians I had a chance to engage each week? But among them was a jazz musician uh, who played soprano sax and played on Broadway. And as we began to create music in the Disciples of Christ tradition, unlike the, the uh, Presbyterian Church, there is weekly communion. Um, it is a different um, and sometimes less formal or a little bit less uh, liturgical structure, but it's weekly communion. And we needed some tunes to sing. And so I'd like you to go to 603. I'd been spending a lot of time with the music of Duke Ellington, especially in love with the way that Duke Ellington brought both what I would call the shadows and the light into his music. If you don't know, friends, the Duke Ellington's sacred concerts, which were performed at St. John the Divine in the late 60s, they're incredible, beautiful. Uh, Mahalia Jackson, the famous jazz singer, recorded his great piece, The Lord is My Shepherd. This is not uh, Duke Ellington, nor is it Mahalia Jackson, I should say. But friends, I would invite you to, as we're going to sing this this morning, to see what you notice. Oh. 
and I really mean this, pulling back, what do you hear? What comes through in this particular Lamb of God? And friends, I will be honest, the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, is a, I want to say a relic. It is a text that is always and almost uh, often sung in Episcopal and in Catholic liturgical spaces. How many of you have been to a, a Mass or to Eucharist in an Episcopal context? Usually after the bread is broken, there is a moment when then we, um, we sing what's called the fraction or the Lamb of God. Um, and not that it always has to be sung at that moment, but I want to name this as an ancient liturgical text. Probably goes back to uh, seventh, eighth century probably, um, adapted uh, in this way. But what did you hear and what did you notice in the music and the feeling and the, and the energy of that particular expression? 1940s, big band. 1940s, big band. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's modulating the key of every other stanza. I'm grateful for it. Just in terms of the melody, in terms of the feeling, what did it, what came through? Yeah, maybe a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a jazzy torch songy sort of a feel. Um, and yet also gentle, peaceful, lullaby-ish. Yeah. There's something about the um, have mercy. Will you say that with me? Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. How many of you have ever had to ask for mercy? And I have often, when I spend time with a liturgical text or with a text set to music, one of the things and one of the practices that I bring into this process is I walk with a text and I say it aloud over and over and over again so that it feels like the text actually gets inside me. And then when I am able to then give it life through music, I'm, at, I'm hopefully honoring the rhythms and the feeling of the text. Yeah. We're going to sing it this morning as a confession. And I think that it will work in that context beautifully as well. Um, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of earth. Let's sing it together, the whole thing through. We're going to sing it again this morning. I just invite you to be present to whatever the newness of this might be for you and in this community.
so much. Oh, a couple pages forward. 592. Another, another experience. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 592. 592. Friends, just say with me, Hosanna. Hosanna. Or you could say Hosanna, too. Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. Oh, I know there's more out there. Listen again. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. When we think about what that sound of Hosanna, which means it save, save us, right? So Hosanna. We sing that, of course, on Palm Sunday, don't we? So Hosanna. Sorry. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Listen again. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Try that all together. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, good breath. Hosanna in the highest. You've learned half of the piece already. Listen now. Holy, holy, holy. Try it. Holy, holy, holy. God of power and God of my. Try that. God of power and God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Heaven and earth are full of, you know this part, Re Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Listen again. Blessing. Blessed, blessed, try it. Blessed, blessed, blessed is one who comes in the name of God. Try that. He's the one who comes in the name of God. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Try it. Heaven and earth far full of your glory. Hosanna, you know it. Hosanna, Hosanna in the high one last time. Hosanna in the highest. You've learned it, friends. What do you notice? What do you hear? What do you feel? Or what is evoked in the style and the energy of the music. We haven't even added the piano part yet. What are you hearing? Uh, from the previous. Yeah. From the quietness of the Lamb of God, a lifting up into a different space. Yeah. Say, holy, holy, holy. Say it again. I, I, I jokingly, with my choirs, will sometimes say, don't sing what you see on the page. Sing the meaning or the accent of the word. Do you say holy when you, when you speak? Holy, holy, holy. No, you say holy, holy, holy. Say it. Holy, holy, holy. So in some ways, what I hate about notation is that I can only give you so much information on the page. This is, this is two-dimensional. But together, I can s help you hear the quality of sound that I want to hear. Holy, holy, holy. Try it. Holy, holy, holy. It's like two different versions of the same phrase. 
And so this morning, as we learn this, and as you learn it as a congregation, this is new for us this morning, I would invite you to not just learn the notes and rhythms, but I hope you'll feel some of the style and the energy that it, it is underneath the surface here. Listen, I'll just play a little again. Mark. doesn't it? Can you sing it with that real strong sense of stop? You might even clap on two and four. And please clap on two and four. Let's try it. Ready? Here we go. From the beginning. One, two, holy, holy. Ready? to make a lot of sound on that last note, don't you? Hosanna in the what? In the highest. In some ways, maybe there's some text painting there. Maybe that's intentional. Is in some ways this praise moment, theologically what's happening in the Eucharistic celebration when we sing the holy, holy, holy. We join our voices with the company of angels and saints who forever sing the hymn to praise your name. So earth and heaven unite in a mystic moment of praise. So I hope that as we've been talking today, part of what I hope you're hearing and, 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 and I hope that my, my invitation and energy here has been that one of the reasons we need to sing new songs, in my estimation, is because the words that we've known and have become well-worn for us, may also need fresh garments. We may need new ways to say, so say, sing the old, old story in some new, new ways. And that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. And it doesn't mean that one should be sung more or less than another. But I think that there's this beautiful balance of what we know and what we don't yet know, what we can sing from the heart, and what we also can learn to sing from our bodies. Today, I hope you proved to yourselves yet again, do you hear the sound in this community? Do you hear the, just the absolute beauty of the voices that fill up this room? I'm, I'm amazed that you may even have more capacity within you to sing then you maybe realize that you did. And maybe that's partly why we need new songs too. Because they get us out of those well-worn ruts of comfort or of the places in our voices that we're most accustomed to. How many of you felt just a little bit kind of shaky on that high note? I mean, really, <laughs> honest. Thank you. That's, that's actually a blessed gift and, and an invitation and also maybe just an awakening or an awareness that we are bringing our whole selves to God while we worship, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that sometimes worship will ask more from us than we imagine it would. But we serve and are loved by a God who makes all of our mistakes part of the process and who says there aren't mistakes, they're just learning moments. And so I hope you'll give yourself the grace of that in these next times. And in the continued learning that we do together as a community. 
So I'm going to sing, let's finish with one last thing. We began with it. And this morning, we'll sing the Lamb of God, and we'll sing that holy, holy, holy. And I hope that you, as uh, leaders in the congregation, will step in. You've, you've rehearsed this morning. You've rehearsed, and so now you can help lead others. Every tribe and every nation From every people and every tongue From every corner of the whole creation Comes a new song that must be sung Comes a new song Comes a new song that must be sung and sing it once more comes a new song that must be sung and remember you can just echo each phrase echo boldly from every tribe and every nation from every people and every tongue from Must be sung. That must be sung. Comes a new song. Comes a new song. That must be sung. Comes a new song. That must be sung. Go into the week ahead, listening for and looking for that new song. <laughs> and that beautiful beloved old song too and see where they might find you and meet you in the week. See you next week on the 20th, right? Next week. It's yeah. great. Thank you. So Thank y'all. Thanks for your beautiful singing. <laughs> Marvelous. So after since you've been through this, what do they choose the next hymnal and how do you get into it? How did you get chosen?